it is everything visible yes sir yeah it's it's there okay fine i'll be talking about corneal cross linking in thin cornea so so essentially as you all know that today uh, nobody waits for uh, a keratoconus patient to be uh, progressing and going on for uh, keratoplasties etc or do a rehabilitation with contact lens only uh, corneal cross linking has become the treatment of choice and it's a gold standard practiced all over the world now as you all know that corneal cross linking is uh, the only treatment modality that is available till date which halts the progression of keratoconus and is a well established uh, modality and uh, it has also got fda approval uh, as things stand and it is being world over, it is being practiced the world over now what is important is that the standard dresden protocol uh, what it says is that if you have to have the endothelium being safe there needs to be after the ap is off a 400 microns that is required before you apply the corneal cross linking and this is uh, above the damage threshold of the of the endothelium so if you have 400 microns the uh, threshold from 0.18 goes to 0.3 so that is something very very important that has been taken as uh, i would say uh, till couple of years ago as the lakshman rekha which is there but unfortunately majority of the patients of keratoconus uh, specifically the ones who started keratoconus in the younger age Uh, they come with thinner corneas, and uh, in the Indian circumstances, as also in the uh, Middle East, etc., uh, the progression is uh, found to be pretty fast, and the referral to centers where there is cross linking is occurring at a later stage. I think even today, the uh, optometrist or the optical shop still want to not lose the patient and continue to give uh, contact lens rehabilitation to these patients and do not refer. Now. once you have these corneas which come to you in keratoconic patients where the corneal thickness is below 400 mili, uh, 400 micron there is the need to do corneal cross linking in these cases at least to try and retrieve the situation so what does one do in such cases now these are various treatment modalities which has been which have been used over time and uh, the i'll discuss them this is uh, the treatment modality of using hypotonic Uh, then you have transepithelial, so you have the uh, antiphoresis, uh, contact lens uh, assisted, and uh, lenticular assisted are the various modalities that have been described. Now, the first modality that was proposed way back in 2007 was by Hafizi et al., and they described the installation of hypotonic riboflavin. So you all know we started with dextran, then went on to uh, the HPMC, and then uh, the, uh, these are for the thin corneas where you have hypotonic riboflavin. riboflavin so what you are doing is that because it is a hypotonic riboflavin you are constantly putting drops uh, so there is an increase in the intraoperative time this is uh, you have to wait till such time that the cornea swells up so actually you are inducing a swelling up of the cornea by using hypotonic riboflavin now the disadvantage of this is that the riboflavin that is going is of a relatively lower concentration of the collagen and the the stroma gets hydrated because the stroma gets hydrated the collagen fibers become farther apart and therefore the effect of cross linking in the hypoosmolar riboflavin is less now the next thing that came was that because what we said was that uh, the endothelium needs to be 400 microns or more away from the uh, focusing of the ultraviolet light so therefore the idea came that if we do not remove the epithelium that means that the 60 microns to 65 microns that we have of the thickness of the epithelium that is saved and therefore the uh, you are working on a thicker cornea as compared to an epi of cornea so this was called as a trans epithelial uh, cross linking in which there was no epithelial debridement that was done and there were attempts to loosen the attachments of the epithelium by applying proprocan eye drops every 5 minutes for 15 minutes or by using back or by using uh, edta etc by which you could actually pre soak the cornea and uh, by loosening the epithelial uh, uh, barriers you would be able to have a concentration but again the problem here was that the concentration of the riboflavin Uh, into the cornea was much lower and therefore the trans epithelial cross linking did not give as good results now the next thing that came was that if we are able to induce a permeation of the riboflavin by using electrical current so that is called as antiphoresis 
which is a non invasive technique in which a small electric current is applied to enhance an ionized drugs penetration through the intact epithelium so this is what uh, was uh, thought to be good and the major advantage that was touted was that it would spare the epithelium and would avoid the discomfort could make it therefore an office procedure and and the infection etc would be avoided because you are not going to have the epi off but again the problem here is that even though the riboflavin is negatively charged structure and has low mo low molecular weight that is being used the antiphoresis did not give excellent results the procedure of antiphoresis is shown here where an annular suction ring is applied from here you have an electric current that is applied and 0.1% riboflavin no dextran or sodium chloride and addition of two enhancers that is edt and uh, and trometol were put onto the riboflavin and a constant current generator was given and after this because it was able to penetrate through the uh, intact epithelium you gave an irradiation uh, of uh, 10 uh, milliwatts for 9 minutes so that is what was done now the initial study that was given by vincigura et al which was of 20 eyes 12 month follow up there was a halting of the progression of the keratoconus and a significant improvement in the corrected dis uh, distance vision acuity now what was again looked at by other people was that the trans epithelium cross linking the efficacy was controversial as the penetration of riboflavin was again found to be deficient so whether it was an epi on procedure with paracane or whether it was a trans epithelial with the antiphoresis the penetration of riboflavin was less and the other problem that is there is which was highlighted subsequently that when the epithelium is on the epithelium takes away the oxygen availability and as you all know that when you have to cross link a cornea the oxygen should be available so if the epithe has been scraped off then the stroma does not take up that much of oxygen as much as the oxygen which is taken by the epithelium so that was another reason why the effect was not found to be good in the trans epithelium and these are 23% of keratoconus cases in the trans epithelial group continue to progress this was sotters at all who said versus the epi off so epi of you had a much higher response that was there as compared to whether it is trans epithelial with antiphoresis or trans epithelial otherwise now the next thing that came to increase the thickness of the cornea so that you have the endothelium that is away was described by uh, uh, susan et al uh, susan jacob et al from the agarwal eye hospitals and they used a soft contact lens so you are using a soft contact lens to artificially increase the distance between the top of the cornea and the endothelium but the problem was that the riboflavin could be trapped in the precorneal space the absorption properties of a soft contact lens are obviously different from a stroma and there is an inability to customize the thickness of the cross uh, contact lens so it's a standard 100 micron thickness of the contact lens which is there and there is a buckling of the contact lens due to the procedure so these are the disadvantages of the contact lens induced or contact lens uh, uh, contact lens assisted cross linking now we in our group have described a technique called as tailored stromal expansion by using a smile lenticule so this is something that we have described which has been published in the journal of cataract and refractive surgery in the year 2015 now what we do is that depending upon the thickness of the cornea of the keratoconic patient that means supposing a keratoconic patient epi of as 340 microns of corneal thickness so you want it to be increased by 60 microns so if you are having a patient of smile which is say five uh, which is say four diopters of refractive error then the lenticule that you will be taking out the central part of the lenticule that you take out in the smile would be approximately 60 microns and you will place this lenticule onto the keratoconic cornea and the thickest portion of the lenticule will be over the thinnest portion of the keratoconic cornea so this is essentially the procedure that you have where you remove the epithelium so it is an epi epi off procedure uh, you have a, a patient of smile uh, you can post these patients uh, on the same day or you can have a, a smile lenticule preserved also you can preserve it in uh, mk medium or whatever you want and you have taken out this lenticule 
and you are placing it on top of the recipient. So obviously you will have to do the try out test in these patients and uh, uh, see that the patient is not transmitting any disease. So this is what you do. So you soak the uh, lenticule and you can see as also the endothelium and you can see that uh, we had uh, a good penetration after the cross linking has been done the lenticule which sticks very well is then removed and then you, uh, uh, you then after the cross linking you normally place the contact lens as is there now we have shown excellent results in these cases these were the results that were published but we have since uh, a long follow up and and the first series that we did the lowest corneal thickness that we had a p of was 326 324 actually and we got good results there was no loss of the endothelium and the demarcation lines that came uh, were good. There was the stromal haze that you normally get after uh, the uh, after the cross linking, which uh, which absorbed. And you can see that this is the contact. Uh, this is the cross linking the uh, demarcation line that you can see that comes out pretty well in these cases. So the advantages of our technique are that this is a physiological increase in the thickness of the cornea. You are using stroma only to increase the stromal thickness. You can tailor make the expansion. So supposing I have a 10, 10 diopter uh, smile patient, so I will be having about 130 microns. So you can actually tailor make the uh, stromal expansion and you can augment it over the area where you want. There is a very firm adherence to the underlying cornea of the stroma. So therefore, there is no question of any buckling. There is no question of pooling of any uh, uh, riboflavin, etc. And you get a great outcome. Now, we have subsequently a five-year follow-up. We have published of three cases of intracorneal ring segment implantation along with lenticule-assisted stromal augmentation for cross-linking in thin corneas in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, so this has been pu published uh, uh, recently as a case report in this year only. And what you have seen here is that these are the three cases and they had extremely thin corneas. And you can see that pre-operatively, the, uh, the keratometry is from 73.5 because we are using an intracorneal ring segment and a lenticule-assisted uh, cross-linking. Uh, this has gone down to 65.7. From 55.4, it is 49. From 60.6, it has gone to 49.5. And you can see that the Logmar best corrected visual acuity uh, has improved significantly in all three cases. So it is a good technique, even if you are doing it in advance. So we, we have we have advanced keratoconus. We are doing uh, the uh, intacts, but obviously the thickness in the paracentral region has to be sufficient for us to uh, work with the intracorneal ring segments that is there. So this is a picture of the, the uh, Visumax laser by which we do the uh, uh, intacts. We are making the channels and uh, we are putting in the intacts ring. And then we go ahead, uh, put the lenticule, as you can see, here, this is the lenticule after putting the riboflavin. You continue to put riboflavin and then do you, you do the cross-linking. Now, to say as to what were the things that were being done, so there are three parts to it. One is you alter the stromal thickness. The second part is that you alter the riboflavin. And the third part, which was not worked upon till very recently, is that can you change the amount of UV radiation that is being given to the cornea in thin corneas? So when we are looking at stromal thickness, transepithelial cross-linking was done, contact lens-assisted cross-linking was the second, and our technique of lenticule-assisted cross-linking was the third. The hypotonic cross-linking, hypotonic uh, CXL was the use of riboflavin, which is hypotonic to increase again the thickness of the cornea. But this new concept, which is gained ground, which is easily available with the Avetro machine, is what is known as an adapted fluence. So what they are saying now is that the total quantity of the fluence that you are giving onto the cornea is reduced. So this is the third part which is now being played out, which is the intensity of the UV light that is being given. So you are not working on the thickness of the cornea, you are not working on the riboflavin concentration, but you are working on the quantum of light that is being given onto the cornea in thin corneas. And this was uh, reported by Hafizi et al. that biomechanical stiffening in porcine eyes, he showed in laboratory uh, animal experiments, that slow, low irradiance corneal cross-linking was there versus the standard Dresden. So if you are reducing the quantum in thin corneas, it is going to work. And this is, his nomograms are still being worked upon, which will be available. If you have a 400 micron, this is 300, this is 250. So what he's saying, instead of the standard 5.4 joules per centimeter square, uh, he has used only three and nine milliwatts. Uh, that is what he is using for the uh, for the uh, for the fluence. 
but he will reduce the total energy from 5.4 to a lower amount. So this exact amount is going to be out in the nomograms as to what it is. And this is another prospective monocenter interventional study, 62 eyes, where it has been shown that in thin corneas here, you can see that the demarcation line is coming here, where the quantum of light that is there has been reduced. Now, uh, Cosimo et al., has also shown that pachymetry based accelerated cross linking. So instead of using the three and nine, they have used the accelerated cross linking and they have formed what is known as the M nomogram for standardized treatment of all thicknesses of progressive ectatic cornea. That means that depending upon the thickness, even if it is 200, 250, 200, etc. So this is the protocol they have uh, made. And they, they have also used pulsed energy instead of a continuous in various places. And that is what they have shown that by adapting the amount of fluence that you are giving on the cornea, you can work in thin cornea. <clears throat> so to sum up, what I will say is that no longer today, 400 microns is the threshold for cross-linking. There are several innovative techniques that have allowed us to stabilize corneas the cones of keratoconic corneas, which are less than 400 microns also. And as discussed, hypoosmolar riboflavin, contact lens assisted cross-linking, antiphoresis assisted cross-linking, epion cross-linking have shown some success, but uh, the table, tailored stromal ex expansion is the most physiological and our studies have shown that there is a significant uh, uh, reduction in the progress of the cone and it is works as good as a normal uh, cross-linking wood in thin corneas. And finally, I think uh, what may come around, which can be easily used by everybody, would be adapted fluence in, uh, is, uh, in various uh, machines that is going to be adapted. And once the nomograms are standardized, this is going to be the way forward. Thank you very much for your kind attention.